Hello medieval history enthusiasts. I am Professor Casey with another exciting character from the era of the Wars of the Roses. In this episode, we are learning all about Queen Margaret of Anjou. She was a woman before her time. She was a lady, a mother, a wife, a warrior, and a queen. Back then, the times were terribly dangerous, and I believe all of these characters were all doing what they thought was the right thing to do. Not just for themselves, but for the future of England. Now, let us begin. You know, being a 15th century queen wasn't all lavish banquets and pretty dresses like in the fairy tales. For me it was a constant struggle just to hold on to my crown. When I was just 15, I travelled from France to England to marry King Henry VI and become the Queen of England. Little did I know, my new kingdom was already embroiled in the Wars of the Roses, and my weak and ineffectual husband's throne was under threat. Many didn't believe a French teenager could rule, but I was determined to secure my position and protect my son's birthright. This is the true story of how I fought against all odds to deny the destiny others had planned for me. My royal upbringing as daughter of René of Anjou. My royal upbringing gave me advantages few women of the time could boast. As the daughter of René of Anjou, I grew up surrounded by culture, privilege, and political intrigue. My father, though always struggling to hold on to his titles, made sure I received an excellent education. I learned governance from my formidable grandmother, Yolanda of Aragon, who acted as regent in my father's absence. From an early age, I was groomed to make a strategic marriage to advance and use political fortunes. Several matches were considered, including the Holy Roman Emperor and the Count of Charolais, heir to the Duchy of Burgundy. However, in 1439, talks began for my marriage to Henry VI of England, which was meant to finally end the Hundred Years' War between England and France. In 1443, I joined the court of my aunt, Queen Marie of France, where my beauty, grace, and intelligence won much acclaim. The following year, at the age of 15, I married Henry VI by proxy in Nancy before traveling to England to meet my 23-year-old husband for the first time. Although Henry and I initially got on well and shared a love of horses, it soon became clear he was a weak and indecisive ruler, dominated by counselors like the Duke of Suffolk. Henry's piety and reluctance to consummate the marriage also left me without children for eight years, straining our bond. While life at the English court was tumultuous, my upbringing had prepared me for the challenges ahead. I knew that as queen, my duty was to secure the future of my new kingdom, whatever the cost. The turbulent years to come would test my resolve and determination in ways I could never have imagined. Betrothed and wed to the pious but weak King Henry VI. When I was just 15, I was betrothed to Henry VI, the pious and weak King of England. Our marriage was meant to unite our kingdoms and bring an end to the Hundred Years' War but little did I know the challenges that lay ahead. Henry was a gentle soul who preferred prayer to the affairs of state. While I grew to care for my husband, I soon realized he was easily manipulated and lacked the strength needed to rule. The true power lay with his advisor, the Duke of Suffolk, who exploited Henry's weakness for his own gain. Suffolk and I were close, and I relied on his counsel in those early years. This bred resentment among the other nobles, causing tension at court. To make matters worse, Henry's devotion to God led him to avoid our marriage bed. For eight long years I remained childless, putting the future of the Lancastrian dynasty at risk. The kingdom needed an heir, and I was desperate to give Henry a son. Finally, in 1453, God blessed us with a son. My joy was short-lived, however, as Henry fell into a stupor soon after and was unable to rule. I petitioned to act as regent in his stead, but I was denied. The scheming Duke of York was named protector, 
and he took the opportunity to dismiss Suffolk and seize power for himself. By the time Henry emerged from his trance at Christmas, York's ambition was clear. Though Henry rejoiced at the birth of his son, York continued to insist my husband was unfit to rule and flaunted his forces to intimidate us. The First Battle of St. Albans in 1455 left Henry wounded and our allies dead. I realized then I could not rely on my husband or his men to protect our throne. If I wanted to secure my son's birthright, I would need to take matters into my own hands. The struggle to produce an heir and my husband's madness. The struggle to produce an heir and my husband's madness were two of the greatest challenges during my time as queen. After years of marriage, I still had not become pregnant, leaving the succession uncertain. The pressure was immense. In a desperate attempt, I made a pilgrimage to the shrine of Our Lady of Walsingham to pray for a child. Shortly after, I found out I was with child at last. But my joy soon turned to anguish. Henry descended into a deep madness, unaware of anything around him, even the birth of our son Edward on October 13, 1453. My son, the long-awaited Prince of Wales, was presented to his father for blessing but Henry did not even acknowledge him. The government was in disarray with nobles arming themselves, ready to fight for power. I petitioned Parliament, requesting to be named regent to rule in Henry's stead. I asked for the right to appoint all government officials, control royal funds and lands, and provide for my son, myself and Henry. But as a woman, my power was limited. Despite being queen, I was still subordinate to my husband, even in his incapacitated state. In the early years of our union, Henry and I cared for each other. He renovated my apartments and gave me lavish gifts like horses. I supported his religious devotions and charitable works. But his piety and meek nature allowed corrupt nobles like the Duke of Suffolk to exploit him for their own gain, breeding resentment. Most frustratingly, Henry's devotion to his confessor led him to avoid our marriage bed, preventing me from conceiving for eight years. My marriage brought no peace, only loss of territory and civil war. But from my struggles, I gained a strength and determination that would steal me for the coming years defending my son's throne. The challenges of producing an heir and coping with Henry's madness prepared me for the fight of my life to save my family's destiny. Leading Lancastrian forces against the Yorkists. The Yorkists were relentless in their quest for power, and I knew I had to take action to protect my husband's throne. As Henry's health declined, I realized I was the only one left to lead our forces. Though custom did not favor a woman commanding armies, these were desperate times. In 1461, I took advantage of a victory at St. Albans to regain control of Henry from the Yorkists. We marched on London, but were unable to enter the city. The Yorkist heir, Edward of March, approached with his forces, so we withdrew north. At the Battle of Totan, our army was soundly defeated. Henry, myself, and our son fled to Scotland, declared traitors by Parliament. For years, we lived in exile, begging aid from the French kings to no avail. In 1462, I managed to land in Northumberland with 800 troops, but had to flee when Edward approached. My fleet was wrecked in a storm, and my son and I barely survived. Most of my forces drowned or were captured. Though the odds seemed insurmountable, I refused to give up hope. In 1470, the Earl of Warwick briefly restored Henry to the throne, but at Barnet, Warwick fell and Henry was imprisoned again. I rallied our troops for one last stand. At Tewkesbury, our forces were crushed, and my son slain before my eyes. I was found hiding in a nunnery and paraded through London, forced to witness the murder of my husband in the tower. Imprisoned, then held under house arrest, I lingered for years in the hands of my enemies. 
In 1475, Louis XI ransomed me as part of a treaty with Edward IV. Penniless and alone, I returned to France, renouncing all claims to my parents' lands and titles. Louis granted me a small pension, and at his chateau I died in 1482, dreaming until the end of freeing my husband and son. Though destiny denied me victory, I fought for them until fate allowed me no more. Exile, imprisonment and my eventual return to France. Exile was devastating. After witnessing the defeat of my forces and death of my son at Tewkesbury, I was taken prisoner. At first, I was kept in the Tower of London, that grim fortress I knew too well. Edward displayed me through London like some exotic beast to humiliate me. My beloved Henry was murdered shortly thereafter. For years I languished, shuffled between various castles and fortresses at Edward's whim. I clung to the hope Louis XI would secure my release, as he had promised. Finally, in 1475, after complex negotiations, terms were reached in the Treaty of Pekini. I was ransomed for an exorbitant sum and forced to renounce all claims to my inheritance and the English throne. Bittersweet freedom came at last. I returned to France, the land of my birth, after over 30 years in England. But I returned alone, bereft of husband and son, with nothing to my name. Louis provided me a meagre pension which allowed me a quiet life in the countryside. In the solitude of my final years, memories were my constant companions. I thought often of those early days at my grandmother Yolanda's court, surrounded by poets, scholars and artists. She had instilled in me a vision of a just ruler, one who uplifts their people. Though fate denied me that destiny, I find solace knowing I fought for justice and peace until the bitter end. I pray history remembers the deeds of my life, not just the sorrow of its end. My beloved Henry and Edward rest in peace, their names etched in the annals of time. I fade into the mists, a footnote in the story of two kings. Yet we three were bound by destiny, our lives intertwined. For a few brief, shining moments, we dreamed of forging a new England. Alas, it was not meant to be. I am Margaret of Anjou, once queen, now simply a woman who dared to dream. So, there you have it, the long and winding story of how I battled for my husband's crown in 15th century England. Destiny may have dealt me a rough hand, but I played my cards as well as any woman could. Though I ultimately lost the war, I won the respect of allies and enemies alike through my tenacity, cunning, and unwillingness to give up without a fight. My story serves as a reminder that one's fate is not set in stone. With enough grit and determination, anyone can shape their destiny and leave their mark on history. I hope my life inspires you to pursue your dreams and never stop fighting for what you believe in. The odds may seem insurmountable, but you have it within you to persevere. Now go out there and conquer. The throne may not be yours, but your destiny is yours to define. I do hope you have enjoyed learning about Queen Margaret of Anjou. She is so terribly interesting, isn't she? Her story is very empowering, not just for women, but people from all parts of life. As always, our content on YouTube is free to anyone who wants to learn, as I believe learning should be accessible to everyone. If you enjoyed our video, please don't forget to subscribe and give us a quick thumbs up. In the meantime, don't ever stop asking questions, and never stop learning.